then thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Shaima, for this uh, very nice, valuable, really valuable, really inf informative lecture. And I'd like to thank uh, my dear Professor Mazin Naga. Uh, and I'd also to thank deeply uh, Scope Medical Company, the official agent of Pentax and Cook Egypt. And now it is a time of free discussion uh, and uh, asking questions. Uh, Mr. Ashraf Al Buhi and Mr. Neil from uh, Scope Medical Company will control uh, uh, the process of asking questions. Please. Uh, before starting our discussion and the questions, uh, I'd like to thank all the participants. Special thanks for our distinguished professors for their elegant, comprehensive, and informative lectures and illustrations. Uh, and uh, uh, very uh, special thanks for those uh, participants from uh, different countries. We, 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 they are from more than 50 countries all over the world. And now we are going to start our, uh, our first question for Professor uh, Hussein Aukasha. Uh, is there a difference between linear and radial echoscope in diagnosis of sub epithelial lesions? This is from Dr. Mohammed. Uh, yes, a very nice question. Uh, there is no, there is no in diagnosis, but uh, in the uh, radial is more easy. Re, uh, radial echoscope is easier than linear in diagnosis of submucosal lesions. But if you have what or more experience with linear. After doing uh, 50 to 100 cases, for example, it will be very easy to characterize and uh, to diagnose the submucosal lesion. Uh, both are very effective, are very variable, no difference, but the radial echo on the score is easier at the start in the beginning. But the most advantage is a very valuable uh, role of. Uh, linear is to obtain FNA if needed. So if I have a choice to buy one on the scope, I will buy a linear one. If I have another budget to buy another echoscope, I will buy another linear one. Because if the previous one uh, or there is an uh, uh, in, in the maintenance, then I have another one. Uh, so the and in uh, my lecture, the first slide is the main task and the most valuable role of endoscopic sound is tissue sampling and tissue acquisition, the inner one. Because in most cases, as I mentioned, tissue is the issue. So if you have a, a linear one, don't worry yourself, be panic. Just two cases, reach out 40, 50 or cases, and you're very acquainted with uh, submucosal lead then there is no difference at all between the linear and radial one. Second question. For uh, an unknown solid pancreatic mass, you recommend an FNA or FNB. Which gauge? Pancreatic? Pancreatic mass for unknown solid pancreatic mass. Would you recommend and yeah. FNA or FNB, which gauge? Yes, a very good question. Yes, a very good question. If the mass is straightforward or looks like a pancreatic adenocarcinoma, you can diagnose it, affecting it strongly by just the endoscopic picture, obstructive jaundice, head mass, hypovascular mass, hypoocosis, then it is mostly a adenocarcinoma, which constitutes about 90% percent of all pancreatic men. Here, FN is very efficient as FNB. Both are equal. If you are acquainted or if you are the, your preference is FNA, do FNA. But if mass is somewhat typical, are suspecting coma, or you are suspecting uh, immune pancreatitis, the patient is uh, have another autoimmune diseases, the pancreas is sausage shaped, in the in the five percent of cases, uh, then you uh, should do FNB. But in most instances, the picture is very informative or very. Informative.
representative of the genetic duct carcinoma to both are equal in about 90% of cases. Atypical cases, as I mentioned, when you, when you are expecting uh, spray lymphoma or autoimmune pancreatitis, then you should NB because uh, you should do you know, staining. So you should do FNB. So most of the pancreatic cases, I am doing FNA. Uh, the echo tip needle, very uh, malleable, uh, very uh, 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 easy to uh, to to relate with the lever the elevator. Uh, so I, I am very comfortable with FNE. But at the end, as you are your preference, many of the colleagues doing sampling by FNB. All these are FNB. This is this is his preference. But my preference is FNE. FNE needle is very uh, malleable and uh, uh, very easy to manipulate in the duodenum. But I refer to FNB if I am think that I need immune staining as I I argue in pancreatic masses suggestive of lymphoma or immune pancreatitis. Next question is for Professor Mazin Laga uh, from Professor Tyres Zanetti. Uh, in papilla within diverticulum, usually there is an anomaly in papillary muscle, either very short or may rotate it. How we can avoid perforation? Uh, in the middle of the verticulum, the uh, European set of uh, gastroendoscopy recommend putting a stent inside and then cutting over it. But I don't do that. Usually, I can relate with a regular synctotome and then very short cut, except if I see the whole papilla. Unfortunately, the time does not allow me to present several cases of different views of very ambulatory diverticulum because this is very maybe on the right side, which is there, maybe on the left side, which is more common, and maybe in the floor, you can, can read directly or boom, uh, looking the orifice to the other side. There are many different shapes, but as long as we are inside with the guide wires in Ketotom, and the wires inside the common bell duct, I can make a shortcut followed by balloon dilatation to avoid perforation if I can see the upper limit of the bubble. Uh, next question for Professor Mazin. How to differentiate submucosa and sphincter muscle to avoid perforation during pre-cut sphincrotomy? As we see in the videos, we shorten the needle as much as possible and we start by cutting the mucosa. Even submucosa is cut during this procedure to expose the muscle layer. The main issue is that we must not push the cannula with the tip of the guide wire into the recess formed by the retraction of the mucosa to the outer side. We must restrict our functioning to the muscle layer which is completely under, directly under the mucosa. So when we cut the mucosa, if we didn't expose enough of the muscle layer, we cut more, we can cut up to the upper limit of the abella to expose the muscle layer. This, there is no risk of perforation. Then we cut the muscle layer as we uh, want, but avoid to try to use the wire in the recesses formed <clears throat> by retracting the submucosa to the sides because perforation is very easy at that time. Thank you, Professor Mazin. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Shaima. Yes. Uh, Dr. Shaima, is there any underlying fibrosis in UC patients led to more difficulty in ESD? Or yes, of course. Or it is yes, like yes, of course. other patients? No, uh, of course, this, uh, this patient has a mucosal inflammation. And uh, it is expected that he goes to, into um, a lot of uh, attacks of um, exacerbations. So there is, by default, an expected submucosal fibrosis. That's why patients with ulcerative colitis, they are mentioned clearly in the Japanese guidelines that whatever the size of the lesion, it should be removed in block. Uh, next question is from Professor Khalid Hamida to Dr. Shaima. What is 
uh, what is the incidence of stricture after EMR, especially after removal of large circumferential lesion in, esoph in esophagus and colon? Uh, could you please raise your voice? Uh, the instance of stricture? Uh, of stricture after EMR, especially after, after removal of large circumferential lesions in esophagus and colon. Uh, actually, the, the instance of after circumferential lesions for EMR is not that high like ESD uh, because in ESD we use a lot of coagulation and we, we, we can also use an APC. But there are a lot of trials that these uh, patients can, be, uh, can have um, an oral steroid that should be started uh, immediately after the procedure. And uh, sometimes when stricture happens, we can give them an intralesional steroids. Okay, next question is for Professor Hussein Okasha. Can you raise, please raise your voice? Okay, thanks. Uh, Dr. Ashraf, please raise your voice. Okay. We cannot okay. hear you clearly. Uh, is it must to use a stopper during the EUS FNA of thickened uh, stomach wall with an impressive malignancy for the concern of potential retinal seeding? Uh, please, please repeat the question. Is it a must to use a stopper during the EUS FNA of thickened stomach wall with the impressive mal of malignancy for the concern of potential peritoneal seeding? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, that's a very, very, very uh, intelligent question. Uh, you mean that we use the stopper to prevent past pointing of the needle outside the gastric wall into the peritoneum? So to, you, you may translocate some of the malignant cells from the gastric wall to the peritoneum. Exactly. Yes. Actually, I don't use the stopper at all because my little finger is the stopper. I don't use the stopper in usual cases because I am fixing my little finger at about five or six or seven centimeter and it acts as a stopper. And my index finger uh, and my big finger are doing the movement to and the flow movement. I use the stopper only in two cases. The first case I mentioned in the uh, lecture in the knocking door technique because I am doing successive severe pushes so I should uh, fix the stopper one or two centimeter below the handle according to the size of the needle to do this uh, staccato or strong pushes. The second situation which I use the stopper is when uh, aspirating a pancreatic cyst. I am entering the cyst, start aspiration, and I fix the stopper, uh, 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 stopper because I will spend up to 10 minutes in aspirating the whole content of the cyst. So in a trial to avoid any uh, unexpected movements of the of the patient or of the uh, of the nurse, so I fix the stopper to prevent pass pointing of the needle uh, to go out of the cyst to the opposite side. But in the usual cases, in most of the cases, I use my little finger fixing the uh, the shaft of the needle and acting as a stopper. This is in most of the cases. Thank you, Professor Okasha. Next question is from uh, Dr. Abdel Basit Al Khamri to Dr. Mazin Naga. When you do a different cannulation of the pancreatic duct, how how you decide to do either double guide wire cannulation of the CBD or trans transpancreatic sphincrotomy? I rarely <coughs> do transpancreatic sphincterotomy <coughs> because <coughs> the hazard of pancreatitis, although we are trying to do sphincterotomy uh, only, is greater. So I leave the wire inside, I then cannulate the uh, bile duct. But if the papilla is very small, and especially also if it is under a fold, which means that leaving the wire inside make it more difficult to cannulate again, so I do transpancreatic sphincterotomy. Uh, also, 
if the babella is not rotated to one direction, making positioning also difficult, then I will do transpancreatic sphincterotomy. Small babella, under a fold, mal directed, but in uh, also if the uh, wire is not deep enough inside the pancreatic duct to avoid that the wire making kink and slips outside or to make perforations pancreatic duct. So if the wire is not long enough inside the pancreatic duct straight, <clears throat> this is a third indication uh, to do uh, the transpancreatic sphincterotomy. Thank you, Professor Madi. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Shaima. In case of non in case of non lifting lesion due to fibrosis or by previous biopsy or EMR, how to differentiate this from invasive before performing ESD? Yes, this is a very good question, and uh, I will take a little bit um, time to answer it. Uh, basically speaking, whether this lesion is fibrosis or recurrent or not how to identify that this is lesion is malignant and how to identify the layer. Um, I know that in the guidelines that it's not mentioned that we use EUS, but actually we use EUS to identify the layer of the lesion. And uh, we think this is mandatory according to our experience to know the exact, exact layer that will help you in knowing uh, provisionally if this lesion is benign or malignant. But what is much more important is to use a high definition scope. The use of high definition scope can help you in detecting if there is an invasion or not. So it is recommended in the guidelines that you never do ESD or EMR without the use of high definition scope with narrow band or chroma endoscopy. We had a lot of classifications. We have Paris classification. We have the, the, uh, the NICE classification. And also we have that um, the NJET, or sorry, the GNET or the Japanese classification. It helps you to roll out the invasion with the presence of a special surface pattern. But if we go deep, that we have a lot of um, other uh, classification system according to the blood vessels that uh, are apparent on the surface. And uh, if you allow me that to share you uh, a little bit, can I, can I share my screen again or we don't have more time? We, we still have time. Okay, so... Um, as you can see here, this is the IPCL-AB classification. It gives you an idea about the exact layer and whether the depth of invasion... Uh, actually, this, is, uh, this needs a lot of training. And uh, it depends on the, the capillaries and the, the looping of the capillaries. And also we have another system, uh, our, another classification system that's called uh, EVA, which is the avascular area. And also it helps you to give you uh, an idea about the depth of invasion. But these lesions, uh, or sorry, these systems need a magnification endoscopy. And this magnification endoscopy is not available in Egypt. So we, 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 we don't have other options, so we will have to depend on the surface, uh, on, the, uh, on the surface that, uh, I mean roughly from the chrome endoscopy or from narrow band and not from the blood vessels, that we can use the photo classification, we can use the NJET classification, we can use the NICE classification, of course the Paris classification. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shaina. For Dr. Rakesha. Uh, from Dr. Salem Salem. Uh, can you explain the difference between... Please raise your voice again. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, maybe it is a device. Can you explain the difference between door knocking technique versus capillary technique in FNA? Yeah, the, 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 these are two different techniques. Capillary technique is a low pressure technique. I mentioned it. Low pressure technique or capillary technique or slow pull technique, these are synonymous to the same maneuver. Uh, well, the, the, the capillary technique, when you enter the mess and doing the to and fro movement, at the same time, your assistant is withdrawing the stylet 10 by 10 centimeter. So you are creating a very low pressure inside the needle. This capillary technique or low pressure technique or slow pull technique is very suitable for vascular lesion. 
to avoid blood smears. If you apply high, high pressure to a vascular lesion, then we'll suck more and more blood with dilution of the specimen, and finally it will be inconclusive. So as I mentioned, capillary technique or slow pull technique or low pressure technique is very suitable for vascular lesions as some cases of gastrointestinal cell tumors, GIS, or neuroendocrine tumor. But the knocking door technique is another technique for another situation. When you find that the mass is very firm and after you piercing or entering inside the mass and starting to do to and fro movement, you find that the needle is not moving inside this hard mass. When you move the needle, it, it does not move inside the mass, but it is shaking the mass as a whole. So no biopsies were taken. By then, you should apply the door knocking technique. Successive staccato pushes in order to push the needle to move inside that hard lesion. So these are two different techniques in two different situations. Okay, thank you, Professor Akash. The next question is for Professor Mazen from Dr. Ahmed Dawood. Please raise uh, your voice again in every question. Okay. <laughs> This is for Professor Mazin from Dr. Yes. Ahmed Dawood. Yes. Did you use surgical clips to help in cannulation of CVD if the uh, ampulla is in diverticulum? Yes, <laughs> I use it sometimes. But as we all know, eclipses are very expensive now in Cairo. So I prefer to <clears throat> have the condition like this <coughs> to inject in the floor of the villa more cheap with the needle. But we can use it if there is redundant folds to fix the fold to bring the villa outside. But now, uh, not so common because of expense. Thank you, Professor Mazi. Uh, next question is for Dr. Shaima. Yes. Uh, what is the rule of ESD in Barrett's esophagus? What is the rule of... Of course, when there is a suspicious lesion, uh, if the lesion is um, like nodules that are less than 15 millimeters, this is according to the guidelines, it can be removed safely with EMR. When there is uh, a suspicious area that there is a deeper invasion, it should be removed with ESD. And if it is more than two more than 15 millimeter, it should be removed with ESD. Dr. Hussein Okasha? Yes. This is from Dr. Ahmed Mustafa. Sampling of nearby port hepatic LA may help us knowing nature of. Sampling of nearby? Yes. Raise your voice. Port yes. hepatic LA. May help. Yes. Lymph node may help us knowing nature of proximal high high restric structure. What yes. is the rule of cy cytology uh, brushing? especially if I don't have spy gloves? Yes, it's a very important question. Uh, if the patient uh, underwent uh, ERCP before for application of a stent or something like that, and you find a high level structure, then you can do brush cytology or biocytology. But unfortunately, the yield of uh, brush cytology is very low. It is about 30%, and the false positive is high. So it is very, it is, uh, has a very low sensitivity and also low specificity. Uh, so at the end, uh, you should have another technique uh, for tissue sampling. In case of high layer stricture here, of choice is a cholangioscope or spyglass. And then comes EUS FNA in the third place. But if you don't have, if the brush cytology is uh, negative, and usually it is negative, so some uh, professors do not do it from the start. They are saying, why I am not doing a technique which is maybe costly and have a very low sensitivity and uh, rather low specificity. But some are doing uh, brush cytology. But uh, you can reach the diagnosis in only 30% of cases. So you need another uh, modality for tissue sampling. In case of higher structure, the, the first choice is uh, spyglass and uh, cholangioscopy. And in distal structure, 
the first choice is US. But if you don't have spyglass or cholangioscopy in your section or in your, in your institute and there is no other facility to refer it to another unit, then we come to the third option, which is endoscopic ultrasound, which all, uh, also usually fail to obtain biopsy from the hyalur lesion because in most instances up to 80% it is in the form of just wall thickening. But to overcome this, we can sample a nearby lymph node. If it is cleft skin tumor, hyalur cholangiocarcinoma, in most cases there is a nearby lymph node because it is a malignant lesion. It is very easy to sample the port IPS lymph node as uh, we saw in the videos in the lecture. And if it is positive, this will be a very uh, useful indirect sign of malignancy of this hyalur structure. We did many, many cases. We reached now up to 37 cases of hyalur stricture diagnosed by malignant porta hepatis lymph node. 37, but 37 cases over about 15 to 10 years of working in endoscopic ultrasound. And uh, it represents about 50% uh, of cases of EOS done for hyalur restriction. In 50%, we in cleft skin tumor. In 50%, we can find lymph node and very easy to sample and the cytopathology is very accurate. So we can reach the, in, uh, the diagnosis indirectly in 50% of cleft skin tumor. Uh, probably after reaching a large number of these cases, we can publish it. But uh, till now, it is uh, just an advice to uh, sample nearby lymph node because it is the most available in most cases. Thank you, Dr. Hussein Okasha. Now to Dr. Mazen Naga from Dr. Muhammad Nabil Qadi. When to stop trial of cannulations? <clears throat> we usually stop trial of cannulation if we found that the labella is deformed and we will be more harmful than uh, successful <clears throat> because the incidence of both ERC and cathites will be increased by more manipulations. But this is uh, not usual, this is very rare because after a trial of cannulation, usually we shift to pre-cut and the success rate in pre-cut only maybe two to three percent of the cases uh, shifted to pre-cut are failures, which means that success rate as usual cannulation is around 90 percent, 20 percent will shift to pre-cut, two percent of them will fail and then we shift to another maneuver like BTC or uh, rendezvous technique or to uh, EOS with rendezvous technique. Next question is for Dr. Shaima from Dr. Ashraf Abu Bakr. Uh, how do you know if layer of the layer of invasion in areas far from EOS axis? And, yes. if, and if you accidentally find the muscle layer during ESD, do you continue? Yes, this is a very good question. I maybe I, I maybe I partially answered the question from the previous question that uh, it's not the ES that we usually depend on when we want to characterize the lesion, but it is usually very helpful when uh, it is in the ES axis, right, in the esophagus or in the stomach or in the rectum. But uh, the question comes when the lesion is in the proximal side of the colon, on the right side of the colon, or in the transverse colon or maybe on the left side where the ES is not accessible. Here we have mainly to depend on the high definition scopes and the use of narrow band and the use of classification. And we can roughly estimate, uh, we can roughly estimate the depth of invasion or at least, at least we can exclude invasion. So uh, this is how we depend. Uh, if we have magnification endoscopy, it will increase the sensitivity up to more than 80% to detect the layer of invasion. Thank you, Dr. Shaima. And yes, about we'll... the, second, the second part of the question is when you find, uh, if you find invasion, yes, we will have to go on, uh, provided that we are fully equipped with, because it, we start at the lesion, we cannot stop, but we have to go on and we have to complete it because sometimes 
there is a fibrosis that can be mixed as an invasion. So we have to go on and complete the lesion. And uh, the final decision will be to the pathologist to decide whether this was really an invasion to the muscle layer or to the or it was just a, a fibrosis extending. But uh, it's an advice that we propose the tooling of this lesion because afterwards, if we found that it was a little bit more invasive, so it would make the surgeon job much easier if we do a tattoo. Thank you, Dr. Shaima. Next question is for Professor Mazenaga from Dr. Mahmoud Gouda. Uh, in case of a short, short part of the guide work could pass through the papilla, but not kinking and not passing through the CBD. Can we inject a dye to be guided? Yes, uh, this technique <coughs> of roadmap we use if the wire does not pass enough inside, but we must make sure that we inject slowly and small amount to avoid overfilling the pancreatic duct. The problem is that we must repeat very cautiously because every time we inject again, we have the same problem again. But uh, what we can do if we have two screen beside each other, uh, one for uh, working and one for fixing the photo. So we inject a little bit, we have the roadmap, fix it from the other screen, and then we manipulate according to the position seen on the fixed screen. Next question is for uh, Dr. Alkasha. Can you get close to the to the laptop, please, Dr. Ashraf? Yeah. Because we barely hear you. What uh, to Dr. Hussein Alkasha from Dr. Mumtaz Hussein? What is your experience in sampling portal vein for cold biopsy of cancer cells to pick up early pancreatic cancer? How safe is it to transverse the portal vein? Yes, uh, I didn't. I didn't do it, and I. I, I, I am not uh, uh, so encouraging to do it. Uh, it is safe, uh, but uh, uh, I think um, uh, this 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 uh, maneuver uh, is not so asked. Uh, not no one requesting this. Uh, uh, requesting uh, uh, portal vein sampling. Uh, maybe there is no such research in Egypt, uh, but uh, portal vein sampling is uh, rather safe. Uh, but really, I didn't do it before, but it is uh, easy. It can, can you reach it uh, through segment four, uh, through the right lobe of the liver, uh, but I didn't do it before. And some uh, are doing uh, sampling of portal vein uh, thrombosis, thromba, thrombus inside right. the portal vein before transplantation to know whether it is a malignant thrombus or benign thrombus. But I think uh, very good quality CT scan, <coughs> like physic CT, very good quality MRI, uh, very good quality uh, uh, especially CT with the reconstruction and it can, can solve the problem without the need of uh, doing uh, this uh, maneuver. It can be done uh, rather safe, uh, but uh, no one asking uh, for this technique uh, so frequently. And I think regarding portal vein thrombosis, uh, good quality, uh, uh, triphasic spiral CT with reconstruction and IV contrast is uh, enough to uh, differentiate benign from malignant thrombus. Thank you, Professor Okesha. And now to Professor Mazin from Dr. Osama Salem. Uh, in case you put a pancreatic stent, what is the length and size you use? How frequent you check on it? When to remove? There is two pancreatic stents. One as a prophylaxis against pancreatitis. This is five French stent. And I bought short stent to fall rapidly. The main aim is to avoid blocking the pancreatic duct from the early edema occurring during synchrotomy. So no need to stay longer. Usually I check for it by X-ray after a week. The other stent is that used for treatment of 
uh, structures in pancreas and chronic pancreatitis, and this I will leave for three months. Thank you, Professor Nazmeg. For Dr. Shaima, uh, yes. concentration of the methylene blue and saline for elevation of mucosa in ESD from Dr. Fatma Aydir. Yes, we use a nine millimeter concentrated methylene blue on a 500 cc uh, saline. Thank you. For Dr. Shaima also, do you use ESD, uh, EUS before is uh, doing ESD or not for elevation? Of course, I'm watching. Professor Okasha. <laughs> what should you answer? Of course, we use EOS before everything, before meals, even. Of course. <laughs> Especially if the EOS is from Pentex, we have to use it every. Thank of you. <laughs> <laughs> of course, so Professor Akasha will kill us. As you can see, that uh, for from our local experience, of course, it's not very huge experience. But we per, we usually perform whenever accessible EOS for all, for all lesions because we have to assess the lesion very thoroughly. We are still gaining experience, and we think that EOS should be performed and even performed by experts. Thank you, Dr. Shaima. Yes. Uh, another uh, question for you from Dr. Tai Zanati. Yes. Why you mark the lesion before submucosa injection? Can we inject first to be sure that it is lift, lifted before marking? Yes, very nice question. Actually, uh, we don't depend on the lifting sign. It could help, but uh, the sensitivity and specificity of the lifting sign had proven to be of little value if you want to attack the lesion is benign or malignant. So um, it's, it's better that we already had taken the decision to remove the lesion before we try lifting. This is very important, especially if we don't have the ESD equipments around. If we try to lift the lesion first, and then we found it, oh, wow, that's lifting. So we will remove it somewhere else. It will cause and extensive submucosal fibrosis. So lifting sign is a good help, but it's not sensitive or specific. We have to depend on other things like ES, like the external morphology of the lesion to, to take the decision uh, whether to resect the lesion or not. About marking the lesion, we have to mark the lesion first because uh, before starting the dissection, Everything looks calm. There's no blood. There's no blah, blah, blah. So we have to uh, define the actual margin between the normal tissue and the abnormal tissue. So we can put our margin because once we start the injection or putting the needle or once we start the dissection, everything goes with blood. It's not that clean like we have showed in the videos. It's, it's an edited videos. So these, guide, these marks are, will remain our uh, guide till the end of the procedure. Thank you, Dr. Shaina. Next question is for Professor Mazin from Dr. Mustafa Kilani. What is your opinion, Dr. Mazin, about limited sphincterotomy and balloon dilatation of papilla? Yes, we use this in case of uh, large stones to preserve some of the sphincteric function to be able to remove the stones. So we do limited sphincterotomy to avoid pancreatitis and to inflate the balloon above the pancreatic orifice to size comparable to the bile duct diameter, and then we can move all the stones. And this is preferable to lysotripsy because lysotripsy you must crush all the stones. But if you balloon dilate, you can extract all the stones uh, by single balloon dilatation. No need for crushing multiple baskets. Next question is for Dr. Okasha. Uh, patients diagnosed endoscopically to have adenocarcinoma, CT showing regional lymph node enlargement. Is this a case indicated for lymph node EUS biopsy? Yes, uh, the patient is already diagnosed as uh, gastric uh, adenocarcinoma. Uh, those patients were sent for staging, not for biopsy, of course, because it is already diagnosed. Uh, and uh, I don't sample primary 
uh, first station lymph nodes because it will not affect uh, the diagnosis. Uh, but if there is a secondary station lymph node, I should sample, like uh, celiac lymphadenopathy or mediastinal lymphadenopathy. But this policy has changed in the last few years. Now the guidelines for surgery or new adjuvant chemotherapy is stage T1N0. So, in order to do surgery for esophageal or gastric, uh, the patient should uh, uh, be T1 or T2 without lymph nodes. If it is T3 or T4, or there is a nearby lymph node, then the patient should have new adjuvant chemotherapy and then surgery. So, Today's, or nowadays, when I am uh, doing staging of the, of, 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 of the patient and I find it T1 or T2, and then T1 or T2, then I go for, uh, <coughs> then I should sample it. Because if it is a malignant, then the patient should go for a new adjuvant chemotherapy. Now the new adjuvant chemotherapy has a great role. New adjuvant chemotherapy, the word new adjuvant means preoperative chemotherapy for down staging and then surgery. This is the meaning of the word new adjuvant. So new adjuvant chemotherapy are now given for all malignant tumors more than <coughs> T2 or have any first station and, of course, the second station's lymph node. So when the patient referred to me for staging of already known case of adenocarcinoma and I find first station lymph node, this may be inflammatory or dysmosplastic lymph node, which are commonly found in malignant lesions, or it may be a metastatic. So I should sample it because if it is positive for malignancy, then the patient should have new adjuvant chemotherapy before uh, radical surgery. 